All right, well, welcome to our weekly community share circle. I'm going to be leading uh, the discussion here tonight. Jim is my backup. Um, we got Chris here as well from the council. I'm going to start tonight off a little bit different. Um, Jim approves, so I'm going to read something from Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, he wrote these letters. I wasn't aware he wrote them until just recently. It's called Letters uh, to the Mother Earth. And this one is called Walking Tenderly on Mother Earth. And I'm going to read it slowly. And this should be a meditative exercise. So sink into whatever space that is um, within, without, with the mother, with the spirit. And don't hear the words, but feel the words. Um, follow his his guidance here in this in this connection. So this is letter number three, dear Mother Earth. Every time I step upon the earth, I will train myself to see that I am walking on you, my mother. Every time I place my feet on the earth, I have a chance to be in touch with you and with all your wonders. Every step I can touch the fact that you aren't just beneath me, dear mother, but you are also within me. Each mindful and gentle step can nourish me, heal me, and bring me into contact with myself and with you in the present moment. Walking in mindfulness, I can express my love, respect, and care for you, our precious earth. I will touch the earth, I will touch the truth that mind and body are not two separate entities. I will train myself to look deeply to see your true nature. You are my loving mother, a living being, a great being, an immense, beautiful, and precious wonder. You are not only matter, you are also mind, you are also consciousness. Just as the beautiful pine or tender grain of corn possesses an innate sense of knowing, so too do you. Within you, dear Mother Earth, there are the elements of earth, water, air, and fire. There is also time, space, and consciousness. Our nature is your nature, which is also the nature of the cosmos. I want to walk gently with steps of love and with great respect. I shall walk with my own body and mind united in oneness. I know I can walk in such a way that every step is a pleasure. Every step is nourishing and every step is healing. Not only for my body and mind, but also for you, dear Mother Earth. You are the most beautiful planet in our entire solar system. I do not want to run away from you, dear mother, nor to hurry. I know I can find happiness right here with you. I do not need to rush to find more conditions for happiness in the future. At every step, I can take refuge in you. At every step, I can enjoy your beauties, your delicate veil of atmosphere, and the miracle of gravity. I can stop my thinking. I can walk relaxingly and effortlessly. Walking in this spirit, I can experience awakening. I can awaken to the fact that I am alive and that life is a precious miracle. I can awaken to the fact that I am never alone and can never die. You are always there with me and around me at every step nourishing me, embracing me, and carrying me far into the future. Dear Mother, you wish that we live with more awareness and gratitude, and we can do this by generating the energies of mindfulness, peace, stability, and compassion in our daily lives. Therefore, I make the promise today to return your love and fulfill this wish by investing every step I take on you with love and tenderness. I am walking not merely on matter, but on spirit.
Wow. This is what she's been showing me and leading me into recently. Literally. There's a lot there. She's here. Every single nuance, every word resonated. When yeah, we touch it, we find the same thing. Because it's what's there. And we're answering the call and hearing the call to awaken to what Tich Nhat Hanh has already described and shared. May seem strange, but I feel we live in fortunate times to be able to find this and experience this. How many people get the opportunity to lead into this experience? and have the opportunity to actually realize it's a living entity that we live in and to step into it and become a conscious part of it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. I think that is talking stick back in the middle. Mm -hmm. Chip, no opening reflections. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a great way. That pretty much serves as an opening prayer, I think. So I feel mm. complete. I see the uh, we've got at last count eleven people from um, from the res here. Yep, mm -hmm. still eleven. And so they also they want the talking stick after I'm done. So I'll pass it over to them. They're asking for it now. That's good. Uh, anybody who does listen into this, um, I'm not sure how people are hearing it. I know a lot of people are are playing it after the fact, which is wonderful. Feel free to let us know if you do wish to speak, and we will we will work it in, uh, or Robert will tonight as best we can. Yeah, it's um, it's just a wonderful way to start. I was with the land pretty much all day today in a bunch of different ways. Um, just felt like I needed to do that. And then this afternoon it started raining, which we always welcome here in the desert. And so I just sat out there and let the rain fall on me, which was also quite nice. So this tonight just gives us a chance to um, think again, to talk again, to share again. There's been a lot of things posted online I've been reading and responding to because they're they're really causing some good thoughtful um, posts and blogs. And one was um, a me friend of mine who posted about how individually we really need to do everything, even as we consider other things. And that's she's absolutely right. I mean, we have to do everything. We have to unite now. We have to stand together. We've got to make this happen collectively. But that's also all the little pieces that we each do individually. And so the analogy that came to me, and then I'll pass it over to the community. Uh, individually, we are little uh, streamlets. When we come together in community, something like this, we become maybe a, a river. But if we all stand up, not if, when we all stand up to make these changes, to weave a new, new way of existing, then we're a tsunami. And right now we need a tsunami to um, to bring things back into balance. And so I just want to thank all those because I know some of those people listen to the these shows after the fact because they're telling me they do. Um, I want to thank everybody who's speaking, sharing things. Some of them are saying they're new new to it and not particularly comfortable. That's fine. It doesn't matter. It's just the more we talk, the more we do things, the more we'll come together. So thanks to all those folks. And really glad. Is it okay if I turn the stick over to them, Robert? So moving over to Pine Ridge. Uh-oh. Okay. Kept going off and on my phone, but it's back. Um, first, they're thanking us for being here. 
they're thanking you, Robert, for for going. Oh, kind of going a difficult way to be able to do this from where you are. They would like to hear a little more about where you are and what's going on um, with the whole, with any tribes there, with any people there, with any communities there. Is it different? Is it the same? Do you, oh, here's a good one. Do you sense the connecting of the eagle and the condor as you're down there? There's other things, but I think I'll just um, turn it over to you with that. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's hard to describe. I am still attuning to the energy here. Last The first time I came here, I really got a hard hit of it. And right now I'm trying to think of all the time I spent there in Flagstaff and in Sedona and the energy there. I will say there the energies are familiar, but they're different. You know, they're not they're not um, identical twins. Um, but the end the undercurrents are still there. There's something here that I just feel is raw. I mean, I feel more of a punch here um, than I did say in Flagstaff. And I think maybe some of the things here compared to where I was there are still much more alive. Um, it might be closer to losing yourself in the sequoias or the redwoods feeling. Um, it's, uh, it's just teeming. There, there's and I always want to use the word heavy when I'm down here, but it's not heavy. That's not the right word. I think it's just, it's just this powerful punch. But it's this this teeming vibration at the same time of just buzzing energy and life around. Um, and it's not the heaviness you walk into a place where it's like a low energy. It's high, but it's strong. Um it just shakes you. There's places here like Guayabo. I mentioned a gym where there was a, a civilization there until right around almost exactly 1400 of 10,000 people. And it seemed to have disappeared overnight. No trace of where they went. Um, when I talk about the place, when I bring it into my awareness, meditation, I feel that ground under my feet. I feel that in the energy of that place. Um, I, I don't think I've ever stepped on a piece of land that really grabbed me the way Guayabo did here. Um, and there's this big arc of power. There's two volcanoes, um, Erazu, I said that wrong, and Tirialba. They kind of form this little arc. There's two volcanoes and then there's Guayabo and there's, you know, burial mounds and other things there. Um, so th there is something special. I've heard some, so many people that this whole Orosi Valley, this area, there is just something special here. People from all different faiths. Um, you know, I talked to Eleanor here. Um, um, there's, there's been a lot of people here, a lot of uh, that have come through here. Nobody ever talks about the place too much publicly, um, but so many people visited this little tiny place down the street, I'm finding out. Um, I think, I think you probably hit on the head there. Um, I think this was that Jim that posted about the, the condor and the eagle. And I see that, and I hear it talked about down here. Um, there is a, a little vortex for me here, pulling people in from, from different places. Um, you know, I talked to some Baha'is earlier who, you know, aren't necessarily in ties with the land and indigenous like some are. And, They've kind of talked about this this energy in the, in a very same way. They're saying the same things. They just um, they don't realize it. This being this this haven, um, and I'm I'm I feel like I'm just getting the tip of the iceberg down here, just starting to connect with what it is and what's what's going to happen here. So, um, Jim's coming down. He doesn't have a choice. <laughs> so. 
so yeah i mean there there is there is something special here but it's it's there's a line that's drawn here too i mean they they're protecting nature in ways that it's not being protected in other areas they're very strong about protecting the forest and not deforesting hunting is limited or doesn't exist um trying to preserve wildlife um you know no no standing military here um almost 100% of the energy is from water geothermal and hydroelectric um, it's something like 90, I want to say it's 90 something percent um, of the energy comes from, comes from water. Um, they're doing that in the right way or not, I can't answer, but it is a special place. Like, so when I came down here, I knew something was going to happen and it happened pretty quickly. Um, for somebody that <laughs> doesn't have an income right now. So I was just told to do it and I did it. And it was impossible. And I was told, make it happen. So we made it happen. A lot of people involved in this. So no, there's a great energy. I'm going to go out and spend some time just with the, the land after the council meeting on Saturday, take my shoes off and, and sit in it and connect some more. I don't know if that answered all the questions, Jim, or <laughs> just what came through. You know, I think so. They're listing more of them, but we'll just, I'll bring them in as yeah. one. And, but the and thing I wrote up here, which I, I really liked, was um, this was sent while you were speaking. Grandmother Agnes um, says to tell you that you are becoming a sacred bridge. So that's what she says. I'm not quite sure what she means, but you can interpret. In this she's home, home. I should point it out, I mean, this is not my home. And I've made that very clear to everybody from the beginning. And when I thought about buying this as it was being built, I asked my community that was with me, said, if I buy it, will you use it? And they said, I will. Because I said, I can't buy this for myself. I can't justify doing that. This home is community's home. We named this home Nuestra Casita de Paz de Amor, our house of peace and love. And the O is a capital O. It's all of ours. It's open to all um, seekers and people that are actively trying to mend the hoop or recraft it, Jim. <laughs> so it is open for people that need to connect or just need to recover from the front line somewhere else. So this is a, this is a safe haven. It's a, it's a place to create and to connect. You just got to have a good reference and you're in the door. So I'll put the talking stick back in. Chris. Chris, you Chris hand. muted. Yeah, helps if I unmute. It's just that feeling. <laughs> People learning that there's another way being up to learn. We need places that we can experience that. And we need it in nature, which you are. And untouched nature as much as possible. The more untouched, the more original she is and clear consciousness. Talking stick in the middle. One of the things that I wrote here next to the very first paragraph in this love letter, this prayer to mother, where you say, you talked about carrying earth within you. It says, I, I can touch the fact that you aren't just beneath me, dear mother, but you're also within me. I don't know if you guys had any comments on that. Yeah, one of the things that's happened for me in the last 24, 48 hours, I've got a tree and some plants or bushes outside, but they all think of themselves as trees that I've been talking to. And they've shown me how the minerals from the from the earth 
come into the microbiome, travel into the plants, not just the tree and plants, bushes out here, but all the food we eat, the animals we eat. So the minerals travel through the microbiome into the plants. The plants are consumed, whether by us or the animals. We consume the plants directly or the animals that have eaten the plants. Those minerals come into us and then pass through our body in whatever way and return back to the earth. And she'd been, I've been feeling how at no point do those minerals, well, they always feel part of that wheel of life. They feel alive and constantly vitalized by the acknowledge, acknowledgement consciously of their presence. It's just like this life energy traveling with them through this whole cycle. And she's asked me to tune into it. When I eat food in that mindset, it literally energetically uplifts my body. Talking stick in the middle. Jim. Whoops, didn't realize I'd put it up. Um, oh, yeah, I know what I was. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting as you're creating that place down there. Uh, I need to shift positions here. And so I'm doing the same sort of energy that we've been talking about and just uh, being open to what appears. And uh, I this place appeared the other day. Like the place I'm in, it's up on top of a mesa with a beautiful view behind it down into a, a long valley that is a uh, forest service. And there's really no logical way for me to acquire that because I'm thinking that would also be a, a part of our nonprofit, which is Sanctuaries of the Earth Mother, <clears throat> a place people can come and land stay like we've been doing actually as the events have appeared um, so today i went and saw it with someone and it's i don't know it, it might just be able that we can work it out and that's odd too because yeah at the moment i'm not working either i'm retired so it's it's a little hard to uh, find out how to do it but whatever we need is showing up right now if we can believe it if we can stay with that even as, and, and I realized what a great teaching it was, I've been connecting with a lot of people. So much stuff is coming. And in the last few days, I've had a lot of heavy things coming at me all at once. And it was really stressing me out. And last night, I was able to just let most of it go, let it be. And several things resolved themselves during the night. When I was in dream time, I didn't even have to deal with it. And I think that's something we need to do in every bit of what we're doing. Um, I was chatting with some uh, tribal people from back east earlier today as well. And we got back into this. Uh, what do we, how do we do this now? Can we do what we've been saying for so long and heal the sacred hoop? And they were in agreement as I spoke, some of the things we've been talking about. We're beyond that. We have to reweave a sacred hoop. We have to reweave the way we're doing things. It's it's almost like if you've ever built homes or that sort of thing, and it's if you want to rehab a home, it's really difficult. It can get really expensive. Quite often, it's it's more effective and less expensive and quicker to tear down what's there and start from the bottom up. And I think that's where we're at. And I'm sure we will hear from our our other friends here on this one. Um, but that's that's a good place to be in. And I see someone came in, Robert. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. If you picture, yeah, no, Linda. Is here. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Linda, welcome. If you'd like to speak? Just put your hand up, and uh, we'll come around to you. But we just read a letter from Tignat Han to start the meeting here. A letter to Mother Earth. It's about connecting with the earth uh, in many, many ways. So you'll kind of catch up as we talk here a bit. Um, and yeah, Jim, I'm going to, I don't, didn't raise my hand, but since I got the stick, but it was just like reweaving the hoop, you know, I mean, were the old ways a hundred percent correct? You know, I mean, we can't ignore anything that we've learned over the last several thousand years, you know, now, I think we got more wrong today than right. I think they had more right than wrong in the past. But we, you know, 
we take everything we have now, the past, the present, future, and we, and we re weave it all together. If we just try to weave nothing but the old ways, I mean, it might still be better than what we have today, I'm sure, but it's leaving things out. It's keeping the mind open to all things. Chris. There we go. Yeah, just something that came to me in dreams last night too is the male energy has always been a doing energy, a thinking energy coming from that sense of separation. And I see it shifting from that thinking to physically doing to over the other end of energetically doing, which is heart-based consciousness, presence in the moment, and it's a sense of being. And the being is always moving and shifting and changing, and we're being part of that change. And we're doing in line with that change, realizing our part to play. And that realization is coming from the mother, not from thought and thinking, which is separated from the mother. So we're coming from within her energy and guidance rather than separate from it. So it's realigning ourselves to her words, her, her emotions. Talking stick in the middle. Thank you, Chris, and welcome, Nancy. If you'd like to jump in, just raise your hand here. Um, yeah, I was discussing that last night with somebody, Chris. The the masculine the energy, right? The masculine is the can do, and that's where the world's been ruled by the masculine can do. And masculine did a lot. <laughs> um, they made a lot, made a big mess because they left the feminine out. The should we do? Right, the wisdom. I mean, even the Old Testament, if you go back into there, it uh, personified wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, there is a feminine, Sophia. And that's where uh, we just, we got to bring that back in. You know, it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, it wasn't the divine masculine that, uh, that's been leading, right? Because you can't have the divine masculine without the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. We pushed the feminine into a corner, we push the masculine into a corner and we just got left with the bad pieces. Right? So we, we need the should do back in the can do again. And Chris, is your hand up there again? Jim, anything from the res? Before I move on to Chris? They're writing a lot, so I'll wait a couple minutes and then... Okay. Chris, go, go ahead. ahead Nancy, then. welcome. Yeah. Yeah. It was a thing in the dream. I saw both the masculine and feminine moving from one end of the scale, which is that, because they were relating to the masculine world, which is in its separated state, not its connected state. So we're sh essentially shifting from the world of the time to being in the moment, being in presence. And the feminine energy was coming from seeing things as they are with a conscious clarity, not a thought clarity. And thought was never clear in the first place anyway. So we're both masculine and feminine moving from over here to over here. And the masculine is definitely becoming more orientated to that sense of being, feeling, sensing, which is the feminine energy coming into the masculine. Yeah, and I'll throw out an opinion there, Chris, too, is it's, it's not a 50-50. It's not 50% masculine, 50% feminine. It's 100% masculine, 100% feminine. Right. And it's and it's a shift. And this is where I still fell is I've learned to go to the can do. And I get the can do and then I go to the do. And I just take off and I forget to check back in over here and I just keep going. So it's important that we constantly check back in, do check back in, do check back in. Are we still on track? Or did I go off track? I just. Yeah, Jim. All right, so this is pretty long, so I'm going to paraphrase what, <clears throat> pardon me, what they're sending down from Pine Ridge. And it's it's that, um, ah, okay. So a lot of indigenous people, depending on which culture you're dealing with, are saying that we are entering either the fifth or the sixth earth, and that each time we recreate, and we haven't done it right. The point they're making, and it's one I used to do a lot, I haven't for a while, 
Each earth has been controlled either by the masculine or the feminine. It has gone back and forth. So each time it's been out of balance. And that's why it eventually crashed. This time, like you're saying, it has got to be in balance. Masculine and feminine have to work together. Harmony and balance. We've never been able to um, do that before. So we really have to do that now, which means the women in this particular time frame, yep, they have to step up and the masculine has to tamp it down a bit. So we end up moving that way. And folks, if I didn't say it all or miss said it, please type away. Anything you want to add in there, Jim? No, that that is definitely the teaching. Most of the cultures I've worked with say we are entering, we're entering the sixth now. Um, and that it did, that the first was masculine, and then it went back and forth. Because we humans can never, for some reason, seem to find center point, but we swing up here. And then we try to react to balance it. And then we go, whoop, and we swing over here. So that's the way I was taught, uh, that it was a masculine-dominated world followed by feminine-dominated, followed by masculine-dominated. And therefore, there is no um, harmony and no balance that Father Sky and Mother Earth do have. They do work in, in complete harmony. If they didn't, the planet would go away. And where, where does that start, Jim? I mean, have we even found balance within our individual selves, much less in a as a community? Well, I think, and part of it is you're absolutely right. You got to go into yourself. I've spent a lot of time working on my feminine, because when I was younger, it was it was all masculine energy, football, wrestling, being a wise aleck, being a pain in everybody's butt. Um, and as I got older, I realized this this there's no balance in me. So yes, you have to work on yourself, but then when you come together in in groups and we come together as one in in balance, this is really good because tonight, Robert, you're the host, so I know you have those answers. So I turn it over to you. And, and Chris is going to go right now because he's got his hand up, but when I just was reading that about having Mother Earth within you, having that connection, what does that feel like? Is this, in that moment that we've considered, is the masculine and feminine in balance? And I know you can go there a lot, Chris. So you had your hand up for something else, but maybe touch on both. There we are. Um, yeah, I'll touch into what you're speaking first, Robert. When I feel her coming inside me, like as she showed me the the minerals coming from the soil it's not just physical minerals it's energetic and it's consciousness at the same time everything feels like it's a part of the earth at all times it, there's no point in this circle of minerals from the soil to the plants to the body to the earth it's i feel i'm constantly inside her and every moment through it's in the air her ear is inside me. She's moving through me. It literally is like tendrils going through me of her presence. And it's consciously waking me up to how much I am actually a manifestation of her, not of something separate. It's in the air I breathe. It's in the water I drink, the food I eat. There is nothing in me and of me that doesn't come from her. And she smiles as I say this because it's like you're getting it. You know, her and I are one and the same. I'm just manifested in a form, in another form that she can interact with. But I'm going back to her. My form is going back to her. My consciousness will do whatever it does. I'm learning about that now. So, um, yeah, it's just amazing. Um, speaking to the male and female, I find when I find that balance here in New Zealand, they talk about Papa Tuanuku and Ranganui, which is, you know, Sky Father, Earth Mother. And many traditions have their names for it. When I 
find the balance between sky and earth, you can feel how there's a zone that they come together and work together. And when I go to source towards source consciousness, there is a creative consciousness that sends a seed of light down to Mother Earth, which is like the sperm being received by the egg, and the earth is the egg that gets fertilized and produces the child, which is us, animals, insects, fishes, birds. They're all a creation source, consciousness, and Earth Mother working together in unison and harmony. When we when I feel this creative energy working together, I can see how they're constantly seeding, flourishing, and nourishing each other. It's it's a mind blowing process. It's yeah, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and all throughout there, I mean, in, in many old traditions, the sun is the masculine energy, right? I'm, I'm, you're talking, I'm looking at that tree behind you, and is that masculine or is it feminine? What would it be? It's coming from Earth Mother. What would it be without the masculine as well, without the balance? It actually, in a strange way, feels masculine as it drops the seed, receive, which is received by the Earth, and she is the mother, which nourishes it, and it goes up to become that next seed producer generation um yeah. that's the way it feels as you say it right but I then you have those, those leaves right bringing in the sun the masculine to grow right you're muted mike is off chris yeah the way she's shown it to me just recently is the sun is the fire energy we've got earth air water here and the sun is the fire energy. That's the warmth that provides the life. Right. Yeah. So it's the balance of those four aspects together. And, and the ether, you, which is the consciousness. Yeah. And if the earth were 10% closer to the sun, or probably even less. Yeah. Got a balance, right? None of us would be here. Yeah. And this is what we're learning, that balance. And... It's a balance when she shows me balance, there is a vitalization happens in the body. If the body is getting drained, we're out of balance. If it's getting vitalized, we're in balance, in flow, in state. And I use in state because, you know, we've talked about connection, but what the earth has been showing me in the last few days so much, we were never separated in the first place, which is where she's showing me the air, the water, the minerals being in being in me are actually still her i've never left her and she's never left me there was never separation to connect back to it was just an activity of brain that thought it was separate but it wasn't talking stick in the middle read one line here reread it from here to what you said, you are always there with me and around me at every step, nourishing me, embracing me, and carrying me far into the future. So often we go to reconnect with Mother Earth. And I said, well, I'll pose that question: Why? <laughs> why was there ever a? Why is there ever a disconnect? It body, yeah, yeah. If I go to the uh, the disconnect that I found was the materialization of the world of time and time from the moment of experience like if i touch the tip of my finger that's experience at the tip of my finger by the time the signal's halfway down the finger it's in the world of time by the time it gets to the brain it's in the past the brain only experiences in the past after the moment of experience and this created a perception of separation once we stay in the moment, which is an awareness and consciousness, like when you're in the moment, you feel the water, we feel the air, we feel the, the nourishing. And it's in the feeling that we feel this union, this oneness, this wholeness that cannot be felt in time. So, yeah, talking stick in the middle. Back to you, Jim. Yeah, in a, in a more 
Hmm. In a more concrete approach to that, less esoteric, uh, I think we're definitely disconnected from the earth. Many people are. Um, and how that happened, I mean, the connection's still there. It's just, it's, it's uh, not used. And I've done a fair amount of, of exploring on this topic with, with some other elders in the past. <clears throat> and I think the time that it happened the most, I mean, it's happened over history. As we moved further away from the earth, from uh, working with her and around her daily, <clears throat> the less connection with the earth. Where indigenous people who are closely still connected to the earth, that's why they're such wonderful uh, sources right now of knowledge and understanding, because they did stay connected. When um, the Industrial Revolution started, was the biggest schism in human history between the natural world and we humans. Because everybody was lured into these golden castles called cities where they were going to make a lot of money and own a lot of things and everything was going to be wonderful. And I think that was in big part intentionally created, that myth, because it is a myth. Um, not that there aren't some good things about cities, there are, but there's a lot of negative things as well. Humans were never meant to be jammed into places like our big cities, just like every other species on the planet. None were ever meant to be um, put in that position. And it became harder and harder as, as humans focused on um, the golden idol, which became our be all and end all of how we judge people. It still is in too many places. How much you own and what you own and what, how shiny it is, is your value. So that's why when we look at our, our Western cultures, especially, um, old people have no value. Teachers have minimal value. But business people, CEOs, get paid millions of dollars a year because, after all, they're so valuable. So I, I think that it's not that it's lost. Nothing is ever lost. Chris is right. But it's dormant. And reawakening that is so critical. And that's why our nonprofit, Sanctuaries of the Earth Mother, to um, just hit that for one moment, the whole thought around that is is um, joining the teachings of the old ancestors, things we used to know, what you were talking about before, Robert, with sustainable modern science, the good aspects of modern science, with nature herself. We put those three together and we start to weave that new existence. And I think a lot of people are seeing that now. I have a lot of friends who... who um, their only exposure to nature would be in the morning when they would go out and walk from their house to their car. And then again in the afternoon when they came home and walked from their car to their house. Maybe on a rare occasion if they had kids, okay, then they would go to a ball game or something. But they never would go out and they'd look at me like I had two heads when I would suggest they go take a walk in the park and sit by a tree and listen to the tree. And, you know, you could see the wheels going. Here goes crazy Jim again, where now I'm seeing a lot more people start to, to realize that we did lose that connection. We allowed that to go dormant. We allowed it to atrophy and start to shrink. So we need to water it again. We need to feed it again. And that's a um, big part of our, of our goal, I think. Stick in the middle. I'm not, no, I'm not taking the stick from you, but... You know, I think like as right as you said, we're we're eight billion people and growing now. That yeah. changes a lot of equations. There are some yes. things that were done in the past simply well because it it, it could be done with a billion or half a billion, and we have to rethink some things. Um, but you talked about like how we've come together, and I've said this a lot. We we've, we've moved closer together and grown further apart. Mm -hmm. 
What was the glue that held us together when we were further apart? That caused us to be in community. That when we're now, you know, there's more people in a in an apartment building than there used to be in a village, and none of them know each other's name. Now, there's a lot of things, but I wonder how nature plays into that, Jim. So you still have the talking stick. Okay. Because you're haven't talked about tonight. Um how nature plays into that. Well, I mean curious. I just was reflecting on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and you said part of it. There's eight billion of us walking the earth right now. I believe it was anybody can check this, but I'm close. I think it was 40 years ago that we hit one billion people. It has just blown up. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's 50 years, but it's fairly recent that we went from a somewhat manageable number to a totally unmanageable number. So it's it's harder now to um, find that space where you can be alone. And in order to connect and unite with others, I know this will sound like, oh, okay, I'm wrong. That's what I was looking at. 1927, 2 billion people. Okay. 1960, 3 billion people. Now, 8 billion people and climbing. Look at the years between them. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Took 11 years for the last billion. Uh, I believe I heard it's going to take eight years for the next billion if we don't change something dramatically. And that's something else that, that was put upon us by those who uh, are trying to, trying to take advantage of the situations. Who want to bring people together so they can make more money, so they can acquire more things so they can have more power. And that's, um, it absolutely is not sustainable. Absolutely is not. You can't have, the planet can, I know we've talked about this before, but it's, it is a critical piece. The planet, both from the um, teachers of the past, but also from science, really, comfortably can handle 1.6 billion people that's it and so you get the argument from some well there's land that we can turn into farming land we have the ability to do it now we have the science and technology to do it that's not sustainable science that's science that's gone off the off the cliff just because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done and that should not be done because we're going to still deplete all the resources. So that that's a big one we have to face. And that's one of the hardest ones to face. It's the one you get the most pushback about when you start talking about these things. But it's it's reality. The animals don't have that problem. Can I put this stick in the middle now? Oh, yeah, you can put it back in the middle now, Jim. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of difference between a forest and farmland. They don't work the same way in nature. They don't do the same thing. They really don't do much for nature at all. Farmland. Um, you know, they don't stop mudslides. You know, there's trees around me. You replace that with just farmland, I'm gonna end up sliding down the hill, this mountain I'm on. Um, so Chris, talking stick to you. Yeah, I'm probably going to reflect, reflect on something similar to what you were mentioning, Jim. You know, we can turn, we could turn the whole Earth's surface into farmland as much as possible. But one thing we know, anything that works as a monoculture or specialised eventually depletes and it will collapse. We've had various periods in history, different cultures of, have over overutilized a piece of land where the land became denurtured and the civilization reduced or collapsed. You know, we're talking about the same thing. And it's all right to look at optimum performance of the land, but what if we have a bad season or a bad two or three years where um, low rainfall, which we've seen in California recently, now we've got high rainfall. We're talking of extreme events and optimized land doesn't always take all of those into consideration unless you're very aware of smart and astute about it. But it's that thing, overutilizing the land. We need nature in her form to hold balance on the earth, to keep certain parts of the earth vitalized 
nurtured and the energy of the earth herself present. She needs to be present in her natural form for her consciousness to be here, for us to listen to. If we overlay our energy on her, that reduces her capability to communicate, connect and work with us. Um, and it's not her connecting with us, it's us connecting with her. Um, yeah, you know, if we keep producing people, there's always going to be that point where we're going to reach max. Delaying it doesn't change the situation. We just put the responsibility onto somebody else. Talking stick in the middle. Yeah, yeah. and I put a comment there in chat, is the earth exists purely for the benefit of humankind. No. Is it ours? Is it for our benefit alone? And, you know, because we're, I'm going to put in quotes here for those who are on audio. <laughs> um, more intelligent. Right? When there's scarcity in the land, when there's a drought, there's less food, many animals have less children. They produce less. They naturally hold back. Have we ever done that as a human race? Jim, is your hand up again or still up? Yeah, no, I put it up again. Okay, go for it. Yeah, actually, we um, we have this crazy tendency even to to celebrate somebody who has six, seven children instead of like, what are you doing? Because that's what we've been told is the way to do it. I'm I'm bringing in now thoughts from the res. Um, and what they're talking about is, okay, so they're talking about the finger pointing out versus the finger pointing back. And of course, that story is every finger pointing out is three fingers pointing back at you. But what they're talking about is <clears throat> we've got to stop blaming others and that they're just as guilty as anybody. Let's not blame the leaders. Let's not blame the churches. Let's not blame the teachers. All share the blame. Each one of us shares the blame. And that's an important concept, too. We all have allowed that this to happen. And maybe not intentionally, but it, it's. I think it's everybody should be responsible to understanding the world that they live in and what is reasonable and what is not. And we moved away from that. We let others start doing our thinking for us. And I think I heard Chris say, you know, when we reach maximum, we're way beyond maximum, way beyond maximum. We're in overload. We're, we're starting to collapse. Um, it's just not completely visible yet unless you really pay attention. Uh, we're even about to pass, if we haven't already, that one and a half degree critical point of point of no return. Things will change now. So we are beyond that. That doesn't mean we throw up our hands and give up, not in the least. <clears throat> it means um, we have lost a lot because of the way we have lived. Different to what you're saying, Robert. Instead of being reasonable and saying, oh, oh wait a minute, we, we we shouldn't open more golf courses on this part of the land, it doesn't belong there. We shouldn't have a lot more babies, we're heading into a drought time. Uh, we've just continued to squander the resources thinking they were always going to be there. And that's something we've blamed various things for, including religion. And again, everybody shares some of the responsibility for that. But we have to concentrate on all that there is still to save, and there's a lot. That's where we need to focus. Stop looking back. All that does is, in my opinion, make you sad or depressed. Uh, and I know, because I do it at times. I'll, I'll be walking out there in the woods, and suddenly I'll be going, man, when I was 30, 20, 30 years old, I would take this walk and I would see butterflies everywhere and birds everywhere and I'd drink water out of the stream, but can't do that now. And then I'll see butterflies on the side or a beautiful tree in bloom and realize there's still a lot there. But the longer we wait, the less we'll be there. So I think it's really important to accept what we've done, not to, to take a lot of guilt over it. That's not going to help. It's done. 
but to to stop and to shift. Thank you, folks, for your continuing words. Okay, I got them caught up for a moment. Stick in the middle. All right. Waiting for that. Now I put there in chat. It's not illegal to cure for the earth. Last time I checked, recycling is not illegal. Mm -hmm. Avoiding harsh chemicals, dumping down your drain, doing whatever, dumping paint down the sewer drain. Mm -hmm. Not that's illegal, but it's not illegal to not do that. Um, we shouldn't have to legislate morality. Um, the government's already incentivized in many ways, right, with recycling and things. So. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's us. <laughs> it's, yeah. We don't we need leadership, right? We have a conscience. We have, we all, mm -hmm. uh, in this day and age, there's enough knowledge, at least in, in where most of, I think all of us are from, that we understand that there are limited resources, mm -hmm. right? Chris? Yeah, just reflecting as you're talking, Jim. You know, when you were speaking about maximum number on the earth, and I mentioned it, I was thinking of humans and if they maximum maximize food production. But in maximizing food production, we're taken away from the land, which naturally sustains our environment by purifying the air and things like that. We see that happening in Brazil and the Amazon. And we can maximize for human consumption but that doesn't mean we're maximizing for life. And this is what we've going to come back to. And I was having a conversation with somebody recently who talked about how farmers are realizing, you know, they used to clear land, put fences up and have paddocks and just produce crops and animals in those paddocks. But they're finding now they're having strips of natural bush and between those paddocks bring insects, bird life and things, which actually makes the land more productive by bringing nature back in balance with our utilization or what we do with the land. And there's a balance between the two. To maximize anything, there needs to be that balance, which is what this whole discussion is about. We've got out of balance and that balance has to become back in every facet of life, nothing left out, including the mother. She is our prime. Talking stick in the middle. Yeah, and I just go back to that point in case anybody watches this later isn't aware, Jim. You're talking about that point of no return, that 1.5. I don't want this to be a doomsday message here. No. You know, you know, we're going to shift here to what we can do. Um, but a lot of that is coming because it, as the earth heats up, we know the ice caps are melting, the polar ice caps are melting, a lot of ice is melting. There's a lot of methane, you know, trapped in those ice caps. And that that's where it becomes its own cycle. Um, it gets hot enough, it melts. Methane is released, which is 28 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, and then that increases heat. And it just becomes, until we go into another ice age, things get trapped back in. The Earth is going to be fine. This isn't about saving Earth. I think we've said that uh, in just about every one of these meetings. This isn't about saving the Earth. The Earth is fine. Right? I mean, yeah, we, we might preserve a lot of what is here, but it's going to be okay. It's going to evolve. It's going to come out with some neat new species down the road earth is fine this is about saving our own height this isn't uh you know we always hear caring for mother earth well it, it's really it's, it's caring for ourselves you know um I'm not sure why we don't pitch it that way um whoever had their hand up next there i think that let me, let me just jump for one second because it looks like i got a message from linda who's here with us it looks like she may have to leave in a bit, so she's thanking us, and uh, I want to thank her for being here. This is great. Thank you, Linda. Hope you can stay longer, but if you can't, we get it. All right, I think that moves to you, Chris. Yeah, <clears throat> the thing that I remember is just mentioning that, Robert. I've said this before, when... I. I came over to the US, the mother had said to me before I left that we've got to come in line with her and live within her guidance and her fold. 
which is her living environment and how that works. And we've got to become a living part of that environment, which she's still teaching me about. And I asked her about, you know, protesting all these things that, you know, I felt needed to change. And she just said to her, that's just conflict and she doesn't need that anymore. Those of us who can and can listen is to walk in the right way, is to walk in her guidance, her energy, whatever words we use, it's not quite fully encompassing that living experience of being a part of her, which is what she's shown me. And by living that, we're restoring life through every action, every word, every movement that is done in line with that. Every time we slip out, we learn and we come back. But yeah, as she said, it's not a time of protest anymore. It's a time of doing. And we've, yeah, doing in line with her. Talking stick in the middle. Go ahead, Jim. Is zero, is zero carbon footprint enough at this point? So writes Robert. The answer to that is pretty simple. Hell no. no nothing we have done to this point is enough. Not near enough. We have to seriously um, look at what we've done and accept we're going to have to do major changes because absolutely the earth is fine. And these people are still wandering around. Oh, we got to save the earth. No, we don't. She's got this. If it takes her a million years to get her, her forests back the way they were and her waters, it doesn't matter because time is immaterial to earth. It's ourselves we need to, to focus on. And that's taking some heavy lifting. I wish I had the answers. I want us to do a show yeah. a little bit down the road about that, about um, about um, what what do we do? How do we come together? That is a tough one, and and I'm hoping we do that with a a larger audience, a larger participatory group, because. No one has the answers for that yet. Nothing we've tried has worked. Following somebody else or some other group is absolutely not the answer. Waiting for some deity to come down and do it is not the answer. It has to be, it has to come from our hearts, from inside. And to me, that is part of, of the, the God energy. Because to me, creator is partly in me and partly out there it's also partly the individual and partly the collective it's through everything so in a way we're, we're working with that energy yes but i think the universe is waiting for us to solve this or not and i wish the answer i wish someone would give us the answer even if we had to do the work but no it's up to us to to uncover the answer and I'm seeing a lot of things happen that are a good thing. You know, I watch you, Robert, and and your your trust in what you're doing. And you're just one example. There's a lot of people like you I know. And it's like, wow, that's what we need to be doing now. We can't fear moving ahead. We can't, um, well, you know, I get a lot of people still, well, I'll lose everything I have. You might. You might. I've walked through that. I'm still alive. Um, whatever it has to change and I'm going to go back now to our folks if I may at Pine Ridge and they're talking about it's um, the uh, what about the Bible people or the I follow the Bible people for those who think who say they understand and know the whole Bible and exactly what it means I'm sorry that's not true. And if that's what they want to do, and if that's how they want to go about their life, go for it. And what they're saying is it's caused a lot of the trouble, and it has, because it's misinterpreted. That whole nonsense, in my opinion, of how humans are supposed to uh, use and control nature to their own um, 
their own good. I forget how that's said, but it, that's the that's the import of it. I don't think that's the case at all. And of course, there's the Bible, and then there's the Bible. So, yeah, I don't um, I don't think there's time either to let anybody, no matter what they think, if you have people standing on the side throwing bricks as we go along to do this. You know, we just have to let them and ignore them and continue with what we're doing because we know uh, it's what has to be done if we're going to uh, work our work our way through this. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and I think, um, Jim, you're wrong because I think something divine is going to come down and take care of things because I was just looking at uh, Thich Nhat Hanh here and at the very last line says, I am not merely walking on matter but on spirit. You're walking on the divinity that is going to take care of the problem if we don't. Well, yeah. So. <laughs> and the more the, the mother will shake her robes and clean them off. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really want to touch on that, and I don't know if I should. Um, you know, I'm well versed in the Bible and many other things. I know so. you are. I know you are. It's <laughs> but, yeah. And then there's then there's a big difference. I'll go with this, and depending on where you go with, with Judaism, and I even had a Jewish person tell me that they're they're pagan because they're earth based. They're caretakers of the earth. You know, and they believe in the when they're resurrected, um, other than the Sadducees, but that they're going to get us back on this earth. That they need to take care of it. It's their job to beautify and to protect the earth. That is a Jewish principle. And somewhere, and I'm not going to say in Jesus, but in Christianity, perhaps, and not all. I mean, there's a third of the world is Christian. There's a lot of different views, right? There's a thousand, but um, if, waiting for you know some second coming to come and cleanse thing. I, and I've seen those comments in chat on YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube, do a lot of research as an interfaith minister, and I do see exactly what they're talking about on the res. Don't worry about it because he's coming any day and it's all going to get taken care of. But um, so there are those out there. Um, we can't worry about that. You know, we have to do our part. Jim, you answered one of the questions, you know, well, what do we do? And you want to have a conversation on it. You did touch on it. The first thing we do is we need to connect. We need to plug in. And anybody else that's willing to, we need to help them to plug in. That's kind of what Sanctuaries is about. Come plug in. Right? That That is the first step. From there, they're easy. But I think if enough of us go, there's going to be those that hold out um, and wait for celestialization of the sphere. Um, and hopefully enough of us will come together to make up for that. But, you know, my God, what I ask him is, well, what if you're wrong? What's it going to hurt? You know, let's just, let's just take care of it. You know, God created it, right? So let's show them what we can, what we did with it. You know, the parable of the talents in the New Testament, right? Where Jesus handed out, he talked about the person who got 10 talents, five talents, and one talent. And some of them brought him back doubled. And the one that got one went and buried it. You know, and he came back to, well, what did you do with my money? They doubled it. You didn't do anything. Get out of here. You're worthless. <laughs> what did we do with the gift that we were given here? So there's my sermon for the night. Um, well, that's good because you're getting a lot of response as you. <laughs> I'm trying to rein in because I'll, I'll, I'll end no. up. Don't, going on don't. a 20 minute sermon here, but uh <laughs> I know Chris has his hand up, but should I read some of the answers to this first? So you okay with that? Is that all yeah. right, Chris? So I'm fired up. I'm gonna mute. And yeah, I mean, I know we we know we have to unite. We know we have to, and we're doing some of it, but it's like, how do we do more? And they're saying, Well, uh look at what you're doing here tonight, and and you've now they're talking about the fact we do it on, online all the time, too. Uh, here you are, the eagle, the condor, and the kiwi. And here we are up on the res, all here talking. So we're uniting here in, in a, they're right. Um, and then <laughs> one of the grandmothers said, God, she has a suggestion. This is good. We, we could use a little chuckle about now. Um, Chris, you're supposed to come back up here, and then you and I will sit here, and we'll put on the tea, and we'll make some biscuits, and we'll invite the whole world in to talk. <laughs> and I only got six chairs. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. 
<laughs> and that got that caught them up, stick in the middle. Okay, going from there. Um, I was going to sort of reflect on two points. One is humans and responsibility in a way. When we have this habit of expecting something to come and fix it for us, it's humans and it innate capability from a separated mindset to think it's something else that's responsible or going to do it. Living it is taking responsibility, which is our ability to respond. If we're not responding, we're not benefiting. We're still part of the cause. If we're going to change the cause, we have to change ourselves because we humans are the issue. It's not something else's behavior. It's not the government's. It's always this externalization. Until we come internally, which you, you strongly reflected on, Jim, and you too, Robert, we've got to come back to the internal ownership, which is responsibility, our ability to respond and act from this place. And that's to me, is a huge part of it. We externalize, we disown and disconnect from our ability to do and to actually manifest that which is supposed to be here, which is through our listening to that connected consciousness, the mother. The other thing I, I was just reflecting, and it's already been said several times, to me, dominion over the earth was our stewardship of the earth, our ability to look after it. And we've shown how good we are at our ability to look after it, which is just quietly disastrous. Um, we're shown we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it in balance because we thought we were more or less. And we've come from that, which is the separated point of view. We can only look after when we realize we are a part of it, which is coming back into that connected state, which has always been there. We separated ourselves from it. Take ownership. We did that. But it was an illusion of separation, not a reality. But from that illusion, destructive results have come. And we've got to come back and where the constructive results are, which is in that connected consciousness and one, in presence, in the moment consciousness, hearing the whole connection, which is at the stage Mother Earth, Father Sky, and the balance in between, which is every being. Talking stick in the middle. Yeah, I'm just stuck now. Jim got me fired up there. So well, maybe the res got me fired up. <laughs> oh, so I'll just throw one more out there. I mean, from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 26, for the earth is the Lord and all it contains. If somebody comes and stays at your house, you come stay at my house. Up here, and we'll call it my house for now. Up here in Costa Rica, I come back and the windows are broken, tiles cracked, you know, whatever food's all over the walls. I'm not going to be a happy person, you know? So do you think God's going to come back and you've raped and pillaged the earth? And he's like, yeah, no, no big deal. I'll fix it. I mean, he could. I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking like a human, but uh, we recorrect the cause. <laughs> Doesn't mean you come from anger or anything else. Yeah, but it's like a child. We train the child how to be in the world, so the child survives. We teach it appropriate <clears throat> action, good ways. So we do things in a good way. We walk in a good way. We breathe in a good way. We nourish ourselves with food of the earth in a good way. So it's there for the next generation and the next and the next and the next. Yeah. Are we loving our neighbor for creating a toxic environment for them to live in? Mm -hmm. To breathe. Jim. Uh, yeah, um, whoops, I lost the thread on that, but it will, uh, just a little aside first, some people are also sending some messages. I'm getting messages from folks who are reading this stuff online and you're welcome to do that folks. I do watch the, the lines. 
and they just saw the posting. They want to know if we're recording this. Yes, we are. We intend to record all of these unless there's some special topic and then you know ahead of time. So it will, hopefully tonight, if not tomorrow, it will be up on our um, Sanctuaries of the Earth Mother YouTube and we'll put it up on the groups. And I, and if you listen and get something out of it, everybody, please share it around. That's what this is for. Believe me, we're not doing it so I get to look at these two old guys for an hour and a half. Yeah, most uh, of this is open talking circles, Jim said. If, if we get into more of a therapy type stuff where we were looking at, you know, um, eco trauma and things like that, we'll have a separate separate meeting and we won't record those things. But yeah, this is... Yep. Collecting wisdom, we want to get want to get more voices in here um, and share that with everybody. This is the council talking. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, yeah, it's really important to have that council talking. So we will keep doing these. I hope uh, anyone is welcome to be on with us. If somebody wants to come and be one of the talking heads, touch bases with any one of us. Um, it's not like we had we have any corner on the on the uh, talking market here. We're just the ones who are uh, ourselves and about five others in our group are the ones who are just running these. Uh, that doesn't mean we want to be the only ones running them. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. I would prefer the uh, the opposite. Thank you. We will listen to it as soon as you get it up. Okay, good. I'm glad. That's why, yeah, that's why we do copy them too. And if you want to come on, like we had some guests tonight who decided they wanted to come on and just quietly watch and sit and listen, totally fine too. Everybody can make that choice. And um, yeah, that's all for now. Stick back in the middle. Chris? Yep, I'm very much like you, Jim. I love hearing from people. Uh, I've got you know, my knowledge, but, you know, my knowledge is gained from my experience, which is interacting with people, inter very much interacting with the earth and through experiences. And I need to hear from people to, to renew those experiences, to extend them and grow from them. So please, everyone who listens to this, who would like to, please feel free to share, contribute, add to. And we, I know we usually talk about this afterwards as a suggestion, but I would like to see people, if you've got any questions in between, like even during the week, if you're watching this, please send your questions in and put them through so we can answer those and look at them in the next session. I hope you, uh, rest of the board members here are okay with me suggesting that as a suggestion. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Open mic, yes, Jim. We used to do that with the radio show, and they're just reminding me of that as well. Uh, and if you have topics you want to throw up here that we will dig into if we know anything, yeah, I mean, make those suggestions too. And again, there, there's a good opportunity if there's something you think is just so it's related to generally to what we're talking about, working with the earth. Um, that's a good place too. If somebody wants to suggest a topic and it makes sense to us, there's a good time for you to come on because you, whoever that person is probably knows more than we do about that particular topic. Like I knew tonight when, when, uh, when the um, religion part came up, I know that Robert is a, is a deep study on those things. And that's great because then we get that perspective. And that's, again, not that we're not judging, not pointing fingers out, but we are stating what's happened over history. You have to understand what's happened so we don't repeat it. Doesn't mean we look back. Doesn't mean we moan and cry about whatever has happened. Um, we have to learn to hopefully forgive it and move on. I just threw that quote there at the end of uh, the reading that we started with, uh, the promise there, something to think about. Therefore, I make the promise today to return your love and fulfill this wish by investing every step I take on you with love and tenderness.
We'll put that out there for everybody. <clears throat> Chris, we'll wrap up here in a minute. Yeah, it's part of that thing, as I say, I've been getting from the connection with the Earth Mother and how she's been showering me. You know, her minerals, her air, her water is constantly part of me, as I'm part of her by having her in me that way. And that this is a heart-based connection. It is the love that connects us all. You, yeah. It's only th through this love that we we feel that connection. We feel our relationship with her, which to me is sacred relationship. So talking stick in the middle. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Jim. I'll let you go. Uh, yeah, and then it's, I, I'm something happened to my screen here. I guess we have a few minutes. I was going to say that uh, I would start working on it so we can invite everybody in the world here to have a cup of coffee. But I think I'm going to shift that because New Zealand is a beautiful country. So I think maybe Tuesday a week, let's everybody show up in the world, show up at Chris's door, bring your own cup and bring a chair, and we'll, we'll see what we see. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You good, Jim? Are you complete? All right. Yeah, I was listening to you there, Chris, talking about the heart connection there. And again, twice now, this uh, I've, I've thought of uh, Mother Teresa. And so I'll go ahead and throw it out there. She was interviewed by, um, I think it was Dan Rather, was it, way back when? One of the things uh, he asked her was, was, when you pray, what do you say to God? And she says, nothing. I just listen. And so Dan Rather has to back up and rephrase the question. Okay, well then, when you pray, what does God say to you? And she said, nothing. He just listens. And she said, if, if you don't understand that, I don't think I can explain it to you. So I'm not going to explain that. I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. So we have we have Chris, who is the Kiwi shaman. Apparently now we also have um, the uh, Costa Rica wizard. <laughs> Uh, you both have your you, hands Robert. up close and remarks. This was good. Oh. Did I? Yeah, you've got your hand up, Jim, so I was just waiting for you. Chris, you're going to speak Sorry. and then you can close this out, I think, right? Ah, okay. I was going to say just, just thank, for those who are thank Nan, Let's thank Nancy for being here, too, though, before we do that. Thank you, Nancy. Glad you were here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Um, it's much appreciated. And the same for anybody else who watches this in between. We really appreciate your contribution and sharing in whatever way you feel drawn. The, the energy is welcome and it's what we do this for. Um, that sense of family extension. Now, for closing us out, I'm going to invite you back to my home, which you can see in the picture behind me. Um, this is my home area. Um, this is part of what I do. I wander in nature and I invite you to spend time in nature as well. We don't hold back from her and manicured environments. I find if we want to be in touch with nature, we get out and experience her fully. Sit in her trees, walk, swim, be in her water, breathe her air. I invite you to take a moment to experience her as she is. And like Robert said, it's not a matter of asking questions or waiting for answers. It's being in the experience that's already here. Nature has already manifested every aspect of life. We sit in it, we just experience it as it experiences us. And thus the union is found. It is not outside this union, it is in the union. And this is where we come home. This is where we come into our heart space in presence and mindfulness and sitting present. Thank you.
Good job. Oh, we're getting thanks from from the res as well. I think we should turn it around and thank them. You know, there's always a group, sometimes a few, sometimes a lot, almost every show, almost everything we do. And that is really, really appreciated. They keep thanking us, and then I get messages that they learn a lot from us. And I know we learn at least as much, probably more from them, because it's bringing in a whole different perspective. Mm. So I'm glad the circle is, is formed that way. Next week, uh, Robert, did you say you knew who was? I believe Shami will uh, be leading okay. the circle next week, and uh, she's off uh, in uh, some islands somewhere, connecting with nature right now, so she's going to bring me <laughs> something good. Yeah, mm. same time next week. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, heartfelt thanks to everybody that's a part of this. Um, none of us could do this without each other. Thank you. And thanks, Robert, for facilitating and leading us this evening. Well, thank you for the opportunity. All right. Stop.